facilitating this. My name is Trevor Huffmaster. I'm with the Blackstone Launchpad here at Montana State University. Uh, we're a center for entrepreneurship here. And um, I'm not a professional facilitator by any means. I think the, the woman last night did a great job saying that. She was not a professional MC. I'm not a professional facilitator, but I will do my best. Um, so this is a great group that we brought together at the end of the day. Everyone's probably a little tired. It's been a busy couple days. I think who all went last night in this room? We had a good, pretty much everyone. Wow. So everyone, and this morning too? Everyone? A lot of folks? Okay, so folks have had a lot of perspective. Um, I was there last night too. I was there this morning. Um, really good. Um, what were really, I think one of the things as I, you know, thought about what was talked about last night and this morning, you know, really kind of rewiring, reworking the food system has been a common theme that's been talked about, um, especially by Dr. Salvador. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, as we look at what's going on um, in the marketplaces for, you know, today specifically um, in this session, we're looking to talk about really what, you know, we've talked about community-based food system builders and producers and in this session we're going to look at innovative opportunities and processing and recovery to enhance local food system and the panelists will talk about why local accessibility renewable inputs make your community food system more resilient and we've got a great panel um, including farmented who spoke last night at the session um, we've got a, a guest panelist uh, michael mccormick from Livingston Food Resource Center. Um, we had someone, unfortunately it is the time when people get sick and someone couldn't join the panel. So Michael happened to be here and I said, hey, would you like to join? And he has a little bit of, a little bit of experience with uh, food products um, and entrepreneurs. So, and then we've got, let me get this right. Um, Alyssa, Alyssa Lachance, they say right, with Rich, Dirt Rich out of Whitefish, Montana. Thanks for coming down. And then we have both members of Happy Trash Can Compost. Both curbside. Ryan, compost. What, curbside? Yeah. It's really I have a long. typo. I have confused. a typo. Did you oh, read Rand? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Exactly. Exactly. okay. This is a curveball. Yeah. Um, so we have Ryan, Ryan Green, and Adrian Huckabone. I got that right. So <laughs> thanks for joining. Um, and what we'll do is, I'm gonna do a quick intro of my background. Um, we're gonna go down and kind of let each of them tell a little about what they're doing, how they got into this space, um, where they're at in the process, and then we'll have a few questions that, that we have, but then really open it up for discussion with this group. I think that's what's really important here. Um, my background, again, Blackstone Launchpad, Center for Entrepreneurship. I also have a, a huge passion for food and sustainable food systems, and kind of my path started out it's interesting, I started out in biology in undergrad, and then I, you know, kind of, I was like, what am I gonna do, How am I, where am I gonna take this? I ended up in the healthcare business, and I spent 15 years in healthcare. Um, but behind the scenes, always really super, about, super passionate about food systems and cooking. Um, so after 15 years in healthcare, I left healthcare, um, and went back to culinary school, and focused on cooking. Um, and in that program I was in, I had a couple of really good mentors. One, a chef out of Boston that was heavily involved in sustainable food systems. Um, and so folks like that really got me more engaged in it. And I've had the great opportunity to work here at Montana State with um, just an amazing group of people. So it's, it's awesome to see the people that have come here to this conference. And then also just in general with the sustainable food systems program here, we're, we're very blessed. So I'm, I'm really honored to be helping facilitate this panel with this great group of people um, and kind of go from there. So I'm just gonna turn it over first to Farmented because you're first in line. Tell a little bit about your guys' background and Vanessa and Vanessa. <laughs> we like to make it easy. We have the same name and the same last name initials. So V1, V2. That makes it simple. Um, my name is Vanessa Williamson. I am one of two co-founders of Farmented Foods. We started the company actually in a class here at MSU. Um, the class was called Farm to Market. Vanessa came from a sustainable food system and bioenergy 
background, I came from a business marketing, and we just happened to be paired together. And we created Farmented Foods as a class project, and just the reaction that we got through presenting it, we just decided, let's try and make this thing happen. And we're here about three years later, and yeah, we're, we distribute all across the state. We produce in the Livingston Food Resource Center, um, which Michael will talk about. Yeah, Trevor was there from day one. Yes, I've, I've got to know them pretty well. We actually did a, a business startup competition in Missoula when they were still students, um, and they did very well and and learned a lot and and took the business from there. Would you guys mind just quickly talking about the program, the diesel program um, that the pro the pr product got started in? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so the premise of the class was. The final project, you were matched up with a farmer in Montana and you were assigned to create a value-added food product out of what they make. We decided we wanted to take it one step further and help solve a problem that he was facing and that happened to be the idea of ugly vegetables that he couldn't sell. Vanessa had been fermenting for quite a few years. Before that, she was very passionate about all of the health benefits that are associated with it um, and so we decided to go with that. Um, and the whole class, like the whole semester long, you're learning about design thinking in a different way of trying to solve problems. Um, and yeah. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Michael, a little background about the Food Resource Center and, and your background, how you got into it. And then also, well, yeah. yeah. My name is Michael McCormick. I'm the director of the Livingston Food Resource Center. Some of you, I recognize you're hearing this for the third or fourth time <laughs> in the last couple of days, pardon me. Um, I, I'm a product of 40 years in corporate America and who I was reared on just how good the bottom line looked. You know, what, what, what was the quarterly P&L? And uh, after 40 years of that, I retired and moved to Montana to go fishing and got forward fishing and started volunteering at the local food pantry and pretty quickly became agitated about what I saw and determined that a food pantry could be and should be a whole lot more than just a place where people in need went to get free food. And the free food that was being distributed in the little food pantry in Lewiston and every other food pantry out in Montana that I visited because I went out and did a road trip trying to figure out what it is I'm supposed to do as a food pantry manager. I didn't like the food. Uh, it was ultra processed, cheap industrial food and we knew from research we were doing in our food pantry that a third of the people we were helping were diabetic and half had high blood pressure and or heart disease or some other chronic illness. The food we were in fact providing to this group of people in need was making them sicker. You know, maybe they weren't so hungry today, but they were not well. And so I got really wound up and started making some changes, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so the little food pantry that was operating out of a thousand square foot old automotive garage on the out on the edge of town became the Livingston Food Resource Center. We're in a brand new building downtown, 5,000 square feet. We have a licensed commercial kitchen that is designed to do a lot of food processing and one of the goals of that kitchen was right from the get-go, not just to process locally sourced Montana food for distribution to people in need, but to provide a laboratory for V1 and V2 to come in and develop new businesses, food-based businesses, because what we saw was the population we were serving and still serve, which amounts to about 10% of the population of Livingston every month who we help feed. The biggest challenge, the reason, the one, one of the root causes was unemployment or underemployment. And a lot of that unemployment related to poor health. Lack of job skills was number one, followed closely by poor health. And much of the poor health, as I just commented on, 
was precipitated by poor diet, poor nutrition. So we set about changing that. So now in our food pantry, you come in, you get minimally processed organic Montana food, lentils from Montana, and beef from Montana, and you name it, and we've got it. But the kitchen is very active in driving new business startups. We provide not just a kitchen, but local chefs who volunteer to come in and help help develop recipes. We've got people who come in, you know, I've got grandma's salsa recipe. It makes a quart, but I want to go into business. We're going to teach you how to make 40 gallons at a time. Uh, we do uh, marketing plans. We've got a team at FIB Bank in Livingston who do financial projections. Uh, we've got agreements with retailers for distribution, product sampling. We've got a local graphic artist who will design your logo and your packaging for you. So we try to ensure that whoever comes in our kitchen with a good marketable idea and the conviction to follow through will succeed. So that's what we do. Great. Thank you. So, so kind of going from, you know, potentially ugly or wasted food that we're fermenting to a facility that is being used to ferment and, and you know, chop up and prep that to a couple companies that are working on the compost side, if that food gets to the point where it can't be consumed or is excess. Um, so just a quick intro on your side and we'll go from there. Oh, Alyssa, right? Yeah, okay. uh, I'm Alyssa Lachance. Um, I own Dirt Ridge Compost out of the Flathead Valley. We're actually based in Columbia Falls. I live in Whitefish. I grew up in Whitefish. Um, and I, I went to school at UM for sustainable ag, uh, environmental studies, and came back home after that and decided I wanted to stay in Montana and try and help figure out some of these issues that I had learned about um, in the state. And, um, you know, I actually, we had been set up at farmer's markets and were composting a very small amount of food waste, I mean, five to 10 gallons a week because it was just, yeah, not very much at a time. And we actually had a um, Zantera, the second largest employer in the valley, um, come to us and ask for <coughs> us to compost for all of Glacier Park, wow. <laughs> which I don't think is really the typical <coughs> way that these kinds of companies start, but I think it also speaks to how important it is to get larger entities on board um, with these kinds of ideas. So they approached us and were like, well, um, we compost, you know, 20 gallons a week, not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we got a contract going with them and uh, just, within three months had to come up with a system to service all of Glacier Park um, and all of the restaurants within it. So um, now we're a double pronged company. Uh, we service all of Glacier Park still and uh, a lot of the Flathead Valley. And we, I, I am now the sole owner of the company and I market my compost product to gardeners um, in bulk and in bags um, and some farmers as well. So. What's the brand name? Dirt Rich Compost. Oh. Awesome. <laughs> happy. Oh, happy. Yeah. Um, <coughs> hey, I'm Ryan Green. Uh, alongside my wife, Adrian Huckabone, we own and operate Happy Trash Can Curbside Composting here in um, Gallatin Valley. Um, and we live in Livingston, so also in Livingston as well, too. But. Um, uh, a little bit of background for me, uh, out of high school I went to culinary school, worked in um, the restaurant industry for many years, got involved with local agriculture from purchasing from farmers and going to farmers markets, went back to school, got my undergrad in agroecology and then worked on organic farms uh, in Maine for many years. From there got very interested, involved with composting and then worked for the NYC Compost Project, uh, hosted by the Lower East Side Ecology Center. Uh, I was collecting food waste in Lower Manhattan and helping process it, doing a lot of outreach and education. Um, Adrian's from Bozeman originally, uh, and we kind of got tired of uh, 
the rat race. I don't want. I hate using that term. I don't know why I always do it. I I, I love I, New York is great in so many ways, but. Uh, I mean to talk and maybe I can go into this more but it's like to really like uh, you know there is awesome grassroots community resilience projects happening there and urban agriculture and urban composting it really opened up my eyes and so anyways we but we wanted to come and you know live in a more natural uh, uh, environment and so we came to Bozeman mm -hmm. to uh, with the idea of starting up Happy Trash Can um, I naturally went back to working in agriculture and worked at Strike Farms uh, for many years, and that's where we started up. Um, about two years ago, we moved off that property and started leasing our own. Um, we service restaurants, uh, grocery stores, about 400 residential households. We're processing about 15,000 pounds a week, just us, uh, and then we utilize a pretty uh, sophisticated uh, gore cover ASP system. That's aerated static pile. That's how we handle all, all of our processing. Um, and that's supplied by a company, Sustainable Generations, uh, that is founded from, are founded by a Montana native, Scott Woods, who's also MSU alum, MSU alum as well. Um, so yeah, we've just yeah, been doing our thing for going on four years now and uh, happy with, uh, yeah, we, yeah, we collect food waste, charge a fee for that, compost, and then, like Alyssa, uh, get our compost, our finished compost back to gardeners, farmers, et cetera. But no bagging. And our subscribers. And subscribers, too, yeah. Try to host community events as well, like Pumpkin Smash next weekend. Um, <laughs> uh, my, uh, and yeah, we try to make outreach and education a big part of our mission as well, to really you know talk about this whole food system, food loop, uh, not you know just composting, but local agriculture, uh, waste prevention, like the Vanessas are doing, uh, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that's very normal for us to hear that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> laughs. Do you prefer Vanessas or V1 V2? The Vanessas. Okay. Sorry, I haven't heard the V1 V2, but I'm going to start using that. Yeah. The hardest thing in the world is to send them an email. <laughs> You're like, okay, how do I dress them? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Uh, while we're on the compost topic, could maybe just a little background. You, you came from New York, Maine, some other communities. Um, when you came to Montana, what what was the ecosystem here like for composting at that time? Or it sounds like you've kind of created it a little bit from scratch. Um, yeah, and, and I'm sure, and Alyssa brought and, be and also weigh in on this as well. But yeah, we came here, uh, the city of Bozeman, I think for about a decade or so, has been doing yard waste uh, collections for compost. It's a very short period of time. It's basically May until late September, um, and they don't take food waste. Um, I don't know if historically, and maybe Becky, you might know of anyone that was doing food waste, but I don't think really there was too much food waste collection. I don't think commercial stuff was happening. Yeah, no commercial. You know, certainly, um, you know, there were, you know, small, like, groups of people, community gardens, you know, collecting from just restaurants, mainly coffee shops. So, yeah, we came here with this idea, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, I was working at a farm, and, and Dylan Strike was very generous and was immediately on board with it and we did a work trade with him where he was receiving uh, all of our finished compost at that point in time for his agricultural uh, production and then we traded land and equipment but yeah it, it's, it's we're going into our fourth year this past year has been a big year of growth for us uh, we're servicing accounts like Rose Hours uh, uh, Costco, Heaps Grocery Store, Ale Works is a wonderful partner of ours um, and then, yeah, at first it was like, you know, the first year we were maybe collecting from like 50 households and, you know, and... It was, yeah, it feels, I don't really know, but it feels like composting is, a, is much more in the zeitgeist as it was even three years ago. Mm -hmm. Like, people, we don't have to really explain what compost is as much as we used to, I guess, at the farmer's market. Yeah, exactly. But that's yeah. kind of all the empirical evidence I have to go on. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. And Alyssa, up in, in your neck of the woods up there, similar when you started? Was anyone else doing it? or? Um, no. no. Uh, and I mean, I would, I don't really know about the policies and the politics of, um, of Bozeman as much, but it's, it, 
especially growing up, it was, uh, it's changed a bit, but it's quite conservative and it's quite, it's very, very, very cheap to throw things away. Yeah. Um, which is what we'll get into is one of the huge hurdles for us, mm -hmm. I'm sure for you guys too. Yeah. Um, so I, they're just, it, it's hard to make the dollar, uh, the dollars and the ends meet when you're uh, competing against something That's like uh, $30 for, yeah. a ton to throw mm -hmm. things away. Right. So no, there was nobody else doing what I was doing. There's there's at home composters and stuff, but absolutely not on the larger scale. And then it sounds like both of you have more larger clients too, Glacier, yes. Rosars, larger companies. Obviously that's better mm -hmm. for you to have those. Mm -hmm. it yeah. Sounds like there's still a huge market for commercial or for residential as well. Definitely. Certainly, yeah. yeah. So great. Um, switching back to food products, um, We'll go back to the fermented area or just general food product area. What trends are you guys seeing in in food products or fermented food products in general? Um, you've been doing this for a few years. Where, do you, where are you guys at? What are you seeing? I think it's been really encouraging seeing, like they were mentioning, how in the last few years people know more about compost. We've seen a lot more people come to us and tell us little tidbits they've learned about fermentation. and. You know, we'll share stories kind of thing and so that's been really encouraging that people not only like the flavor of our product but they see all of the value you know the health benefits you know the food waste side and then the flavor as well yeah. So that's been I th yeah I think with food products in general people are looking more and more towards like not just food that's like fun to eat but like food that's fuel in it like helps the body and what are the health benefits that we can get out of this and like that's huge for us because fermentation there are so many health benefits and so I think at least in Bozeman I mean that's our you know target sample um, it, it seems like that is really trending more and more which is great um, so. great and, and Michael on a bigger scale as you're seeing companies come in to work with you as a commercial kitchen, are you seeing certain trends, or or what are you seeing out there for food products? Fresh, fresh food products mm -hmm. is the trend. Okay, um, we've got two companies using the kitchen right now that started their businesses in the kitchen. Uh, one is Dolina Pasta, fresh pasta. She's now selling through the Bozeman Co-op and doing markets. She started just with the Bozeman. Uh, market I think and uh, has expanded and um, then we have another young lady from Bozeman who is using our kitchen to support her meal service business called Whole and Nourished mm -hmm. and she comes in and cooks she uses the kitchen Friday Saturday Sunday and she has 50 uh, regular clients now for whom she does all of the cooking meal preparation and each Monday she delivers a full week's worth of fresh meals to 50 clients. And what's, I think, exciting about those is that in addition to the Vanessa's, uh, we've seen job creation. The, the young lady with the meal service created a job for herself that she has told me pays her much better than anything else she's ever done. But she's also hired <coughs> another person out to work for her and um, so it's about job creation but uh, fresh you know if I if I had to choose one word Trevor it would be fresh followed quickly by local and then convenient awesome excellent and, and you know and I was it's funny as we were thinking about this session um, I was going through and I'm not sure what the title is here I'm trying to see I think it was uh, moving forward, food system innovation, and we talked to our community-based innovative opportunities in processing and recovery to enhance local food systems. And I actually, in my head, or actually wrote down, I'd say it's innovative process and, and minimally processed food and preserved food and recovery. Because I mean, yeah, I mean, how are we preserving it? How are we minimally processing it so we keep all the nutrients in it? So, um, what are some as we talk about? In the, in, on food product basis, um, what are some of the challenges with 
kind of getting a food product business going, growing it, scaling it? What, what have you guys seen as you've gone through that process? And in general, just a composting business as well. well what are some of your challenges that you've run into? We can start down here. <laughs> <laughs> well, lifting 15,000. <laughs> okay. You can't see it, but I'm wearing a nice back. <laughs> Bejeweled. Um, <laughs> no, but um, yeah, we, we've just, we've grown incrementally over the years. And with each period of growth, we get those systems figured out and then all of a sudden then we grow more and then those systems aren't working out so it's just it's it's all of it it's figuring out how to grow how to sustainably grow how to manage how to create better systems and how to run the business <laughs> I guess is, is a big part yeah marketing too really hard oh yeah <laughs> yeah I would say you know we face is similar as probably most businesses but you know uh, you know young farmers you know access to land access to equipment those capital mm -hmm. bases that are hard to come by um, especially trying to convince someone you know uh, for us we just lease property so like trying to be like oh no we want to bring food waste onto the property <laughs> yeah. and, and like mix it and let it sit for a while and, yeah probably it's going to attract some birds and, you know it's like you know so really yeah, yeah you know so like yeah that yeah that that's you know that there's 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 uh, definitely that hurdle and um but and i i think but and maybe I'm going to go off topic here slightly, but I just think, you know, I hope, you know, what we're showing too is like, uh, you know, as, as, as individuals, as, as a community, like we don't need to rely on like, you know, big multinational corporations or like big municipalities to handle our waste streams. Like we can do this ourselves. It, it really not a lot of capital investment. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, it's like, yeah, we operate off of a quarter acre, so pretty small footprint. And then, you know, outside of our ASP system, which you don't necessarily need, you know, it's like our biggest investment was a skid steer and a couple of trucks. And, you know, we've really been able to bootstrap this and, and, and do it in a way. And I hope it's, it, it can be, you know, this idea of community-based <coughs> composting alongside community-based agriculture is like, they go hand in hand. And it's something that I feel that community-based um, uh, waste site is sometimes left out of the equation too much. And, um, and we were just talking about it. It sometimes might be a little nicer you know, thought of a farmer in a field with a carrot as opposed to <laughs> us in a in a compost yard up to our knees in food waste, you know, but yeah, it's like, it's a lot more of a, you know, they're both dirty jobs, but uh, in my opinion, they're, they're both hand in hand and equally important to a resilient foods, you know, locally based food system. Absolutely. Because yeah. you're putting the nutrients back in, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, you're capturing that, so. That's yeah, amazing. closing the local food loop. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you guys see specifically in the composting area, are there any trends, new technology or, or ways to scale or do more? Is that some stuff that you guys might be looking at in the future or um, I kind of want to take on the other one because I have so many um, hurdles that are, they're interesting. I think they're exciting and they're interesting hurdles that are specific to our um, situation i guess because we're not municipal mm -hmm. composting operations um i mean a composting operation to start and like really be functioning on a, a large scale to facilitate community composting takes millions and millions and millions of dollars and um where it's hard to when uh the when people could throw away trash for thirty dollars a ton versus the average of uh, 49 across the United States um, it's it's hard to convince people to sign on and to see the value in spending a little bit more to instead of throw away this material to give it to me to process it and create value out of it um, yeah I think it's a little a little bit of a cultural thing too right it's a it's a cultural thing for sure um, but I think that there's a lot of uh, I, I don't even know how to access it, but there's got to be a, a way to, um, yeah, I guess it is a cultural change. Like, how do we shift that into um, make sure that throwing away trash actually resembles, like, the cost to our communities instead of $30 a ton? It should be much more. And I, I don't know how to shift that. I think it's getting involved. But, um, you know, our trash facility is... Uh, 
privately owned um, and the city contracts them out. So it, it's tricky. So that's, that's one thing that I find being a, a huge um, hurdle. And also I found that um, surprisingly trying to work with the cities has been very challenging. Um, and I, as a small composter, really need their support within the community to make sure that there's information getting out there and that they're telling people about us and that, um, that they're, they're on board with what we're doing and kind of pushing out within the community and that hasn't really been happening. So it's been nice. It reminds me a little bit of where recycling was in Bozeman 12 years ago. There was some local folks doing it, and then. It's also well, I, yeah, I would like to piggyback on that and talk about what we're dealing with right now in the city of Bozeman. Uh, we are dealing with a municipality that's really unwilling to recognize us, that considers us a boutique business. Um, and it's been, because, yeah, the city of Bozeman right now is traditionally only accepted yard waste. They're looking in to start accepting food waste in their program. Uh, and their whole thought process is right now they have a compactor truck with college students on the back going around in the summertime collecting food, or yard waste, hopping off the truck, throwing it into the compactor. They just want to streamline that to a one person job with the arm. And so that makes sense for them to then just buy bins and let everyone throw everything in there. Not seeing the value in different feedstocks as well. We don't take yard waste because most yard waste is treated with herbicides and pesticides. That's gonna create a contaminated product. And ultimately, we, we, well, we'll some, <laughs> but it's like from, <laughs> No, no not, not grass, grass clippings things. at all and it's like yeah it's like if it's like a, a residential customer of ours yeah nothing from a commercial landscape or anything yeah. like that but it's um you know we want to make a good product that's going to get back to farmers that then can you know we're dealing with dwindling agricultural land in this valley support them then they can grow ugly vegetables for the vanessas <laughs> but we are yeah it's it's they just have been pretty hard to work with and have kind of like shut us out and um, if the city were to start up offering uh, and they're not talking about doing it year-round too we do this 365 days of the year I talk to my farmer friends right now and they're like oh season's winding down like it would be great to catch up and get a beer and it's like well we stay busy all year <laughs> round but in the winter things only get harder for us right. um, but uh, it's just like I'm sorry, I'm really losing my train of thought here. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's like the city is just still going around, yeah, boutique, and ultimately we can't compete. You know, we charge with the municipality, you know, it's like we offer a five gallon bucket for $15, which is super low, <laughs> and uh, they're going to offer a 96 gallon toter. They don't have exact pricing laid out yet, but probably for $20 a month. They're then not going to do it year round, so it's kind of sending mixed messaging out there about whether you know how important this is to have like a community where we're diverting as much waste as possible. Um, and they're not going to have a great product. And, and they're not going to have a great product, and, and that's the main yeah. thing. They're not going to have a great product, and then they're talking about just wanting to like cap the landfill off with this compost. Um, and half of our gross income comes from our residential service. Yeah. We were to lose even a fraction of that, we would probably go under, you know. And um, that's a pretty scary thing to deal about, to think about. A lot of industries, you know, the the Vanessas don't have to worry about the city starting up a, a fermentation program. Our farmers don't have to worry about the city starting up a agri, you know, a you know, big farm to supply food. But unfortunately, we're in this kind of gray area industry where it's like, well, tra 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 traditionally this is handled by municipalities. Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add something to this story. Um, two other things about this. It's really ironic, there was a front page paper, or front, some part of the newspaper that had an article about how MSU was going to be collaborating with the city on this. And it seems painful to imagine that there's all these enthusiastic agroecology students who get super excited about composting. Mm -hmm. And I think their university should be helping them to make sure that this food waste is going into a form of compost that can be applied to crop land. Yeah. yeah. And it's not yeah. happening yet, but there's a number of people trying to make it happen. Yeah. But the other thing that's interesting to me about what they're doing is that I'm a local sheep producer and I've been talking with Amsterdam Meats where we get our certified organic grass-fed lamb process and it has been a burden for them for years to have to pay for waste disposal of the 
bones and hides and offal that they generate every week. And so they're now talking with Ryan about expanding their operations so they can make that happen. And he's got the funding lined up to expand his operation and let's do that if they can find land that is big enough. Um, yeah, that's great. So to me, it's a really great illustration of how, you know, it's, it's part of this sort of keystone problem of what the waste does to the whole system. And as, as local ranchers, probably the single biggest challenge for us in direct marketing our meat is the high processing costs. And the waste disposal cost for the butcher is not a trivial part of that. It's certainly not the only cost, but it's a big part of it. And it just feels criminal to put all that work into growing all that super nutrient dense mm -hmm. material that can be very easily converted into fantastic plant food. Yes. Um, and if we've learned nothing else in watching the demise of the industrial ag system, it is that when we separate livestock agriculture and cropping agriculture, we create problems where we once had intrinsic solutions. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds like a great opportunity. Yeah, we and just really sorry, and I will stop after this. No, it's not bad. <laughs> we so we have we work with this Amsterdam meat. We we <laughs> take we take their blood from them. We don't take their offal right now because that would just be kind of too much for where we're at. We're in an industrial park essentially, and we're able to get away with that because we have this ASP system, this gore supplied by an MSU alum. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, that really helps with odor suppression. Um, but yeah, it's like, we, you know, I think too, it's not, you know, a, a big part of our mission as well. It's like, you know, n not just to compost for compost sake, it's also about waste reduction as well. And that's what the Vanessa's are doing. And, and ultimately, when we're working with this bigger clients, like I'm picking up from Rose Hours, I'm tracking from every department how much they're producing. And then I'm able to give that numbers back to them. Are they doing anything with it? No, not really. But it should be able to give them new pars to work on as well too that will ultimately reduce their bottom lines right. uh, and there's plenty of ways and i think to then still go after in the in the meat processing industry i mean i think too is you know not just compost but bone meal blood meal you know all these traditional inputs that we've used for years and years and years that have gone by the wayside in the past 100 or so we have these all in our backyard right here, and there's no reason why them. You know, someone from the city of Bozeman quoted us, like tried to, I, got, I received an email that was like, well then it's like, you know, it'd be like if I was a recycler and I only wanted to take aluminum because that's the, I could get the most highest price point from that. Well, no, that's not what we're doing whatsoever. It's like, we just know that there's a higher value in it and it's gonna be able to get a better return to our users as well. Yeah, great. Did you have a question? Yeah, I had a couple of comments. One is that in many cities, and you may be running into this and don't know it, the waste department is owned and operated by the mafia. <laughs> well, yeah, there's a great book about about that, about specifically in New York City, yeah. too. And it's, yeah. Yeah, and I think that may have trickled down to some smaller towns as well. I, yeah, I mean, I don't doubt that there's, I would call it maybe not the mafia, but developers, I don't know, same yeah. difference. Yeah, and the other thing yeah. is, uh, <laughs> um, I'm from Missoula, and last year the courts found in favor of a company that makes gravestones, and the city was getting involved with make, doing gravestones for the cemeteries, and they found that the city cannot compete with a private business like that. That's not what they should be doing. And you might check out that court case and see Let's that there is. Fully noted, for yeah. sure. Because <laughs> unfortunately, that is something that we are thinking about: is do we have to? We're, this is you're looking at the whole happy trash can team here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop after this. <laughs> but I think it's these are, yeah, issues that we're all facing. You know that that's facing in this industry. I mean, it, one of the questions is about trends. A trend that's happening right now is this idea where there have been good small businesses are not for profits that have ran successful community composting programs. City municipalities see that low hanging fruit, they come in and put those organizations out of business. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the consumer doesn't realize the strife that that causes because in the end, they're just thinking, oh, well, we're composting. This is good, you know? Well, and I might add too, like, I, I don't know. 
and and we could talk about this later but if the city felt like they could team up with us and um, work something out that they maybe they could do this better you know and exactly. like yeah. I, I want to make sure that we're composting that's that's the <coughs> main goal mm -hmm. but um, the concern is that like you've mentioned before that they're doing it in a way that is um, taking into account all that it should and composting in a way that is how we want it to be composted and getting that material out mm -hmm. where it should be in the quality that it should be in. Yep. Um, and I mean, that's a huge problem across uh, California is, and I've talked to lots of people in California, small compost operations and people that have worked in these larger compo composting operations in California, they're taking in waste and they're spitting out waste. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's not what we want to do. No. Mm -hmm. That is a resource and we need to make it into something that could be used and valued. So mm -hmm. that's my main concern. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. A lot of compost talk. <laughs> this is kind of Sorry. an interesting panel because we're we've got food and and then we've got compost and we're going back and forth. So. Some yeah, but fermented sweet. food. So there's yeah. a everything smells really good. Lots of good scents going on. Um, lots of we've been giving all our food waste to a couple of farmers to feed pigs and chickens and goats and listening to this I'm beginning to rethink that maybe. well no there is a hierarchy that too yeah. a food waste hierarchy that I think is important to follow as well yeah. so. what you can't give to yeah kids, yeah so That's there's multiple that multiple yeah. places that you need to send different things but exactly right? I mean for us per, like there we can't yes we are taking all of the ugly and the slightly damaged produce and the excess crops that our farmers have but there are still trimmings that we have to make you know we don't use carrot tops you know we've there's damaged parts that we have to cut out. And so the fact that LFRC has um, this partnership with this woman who raises pigs is great because we have 0% waste. Every single part that we cut off, the pigs will happily eat. And so we don't, like, composting is fantastic. But like Ryan said, there is, like, the hierarchy. And if we can prevent things from even having to go to composting, that's also important. That's more important. Yeah. That's yeah. way more important. I mean, yeah. yeah. And so you guys probably do a lot of education on that too, with folks, with your customers. Like, you know, if they can prevent it from just don't just compost to compost. Exactly. Right. You know, it's like the recycling industry. You know, it's like in the '80s. Oh, curbside recycling hit the continental United States, and it was it allowed this plethora of this overconsumption, overproduction, because oh, we can recycle all this material. Oh, guess what? No, you can't. It was just waste to fuel another industry. I hope you know, you know, we're just one small company i'm just one person but ultimately I, I hope that doesn't happen with organics recycling i you know there's always going to be waste streams that we can get but proper waste streams that are from processing side and not just grocery stores throwing away perfectly good food because it's slightly bruised you know and that's where the education component comes in and something that in my opinion and i'm going to say this too I'm talking about municipalities like they're a big bad thing. Check out New York City. They've done an amazing, uh, one of my old colleagues, Dara, is here. <laughs> New York City, DSNY wanted to get into organics recycling, saw that there was already community grassroots programs doing it, and so they worked alongside them, and now they have a wonderful community, our community compost program. They have curbside composting as well that's ran through the city it, it's a it's a wonderful model and it's a model that you know i hope other municipalities could look into but um support innovation don't support yeah, yeah. It. exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah sounds like a great place to look so yeah, yeah you've got the connections there too so we should uh yeah have some conversation <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll do a tour <laughs> On the, on the food product side for you guys, the challenges taking food products to market or scaling, what have you seen? Yeah, I mean, I, we can relate a lot to what Happy Trash Can was talking about of just like, we have these periods of growth and we adjust to them and then all of a sudden we have more periods of growth, which is like great problems to have, but it's like these constant adjustments where we don't necessarily have anyone to ask of like, how do we do this? We're Right now, I mean, we were just talking to Michael. We are at capacity at the space that we're in. Again, a great problem to have, but how, where do we go from here? Like, do we build a facility ourselves? Well, that's 
really expensive. <laughs> um, like, is that even viable for us? Do we try to get into a different space? Okay, well, does that space have the correct, like, sanitizing machines and the correct food processors? Okay, do we have to pay for those? So it's like this constant struggle of, like, funding and capital um, and then convincing people, like Adrian said, marketing, mm -hmm. like convincing people to choose our products versus like national brands. Um, we could make it super easy on ourselves and ferment in big plastic containers, but we don't do that because we don't want plastic to, we don't want to ferment in plastic because of the chemicals that are associated with that. And so we could make things easier on ourselves. We <laughs> tend to not. Yeah. Trying to, yeah. Us. This is the whole fermented team, like there's two of us, and trying to source all of our produce locally. Well, there's tons of farmers. How do we like organize that supply chain? And yeah, I mean, you probably have more right. pain points. <laughs> I mean, as, as far as just getting started, you know, they were talking about hurdles like, taking with the city. I mean, we had to deal with the health department quite a bit and just the whole thing of fermentation was like a big question mark mm -hmm. for them. And it was just something that, you know, I was super familiar with, just like on a home fermenter level. And then looking into it on a business level, I felt fairly confident about it, but just getting through all those, you know, checking all the boxes and jumping through hoops and not having a ton of support, like, you know, confidence on their end, it was, it was tough. It definitely was like, nine months till we could start producing yeah. like started the business nine months later finally sold our first jar and that i feel like was even lucky like, yeah could have gone further but we were pretty persistent and had a lot of help um you know the launch pad helped us up with all the people all the resources and um livingston food resource center they definitely had some good uh, resources too but yeah, it was yeah, a lot of... But we're running out of space, so yeah. we're going to talk. Yeah. <laughs> There's an opportunity for... There's an opportunity here. For more, more culinary yeah. you guys want incubator. You guys want to next to the fermentation. <laughs> yeah. All the smells. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Bottle it, it up and sell it. <laughs> but it, it, it was so surprising for us with the health department. Like, as a civilization, humans have been fermenting for mm -hmm. centuries. Yeah. 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 and composting. Yeah. Yeah. Yet, the, the health department didn't know what to do with us. Like, they almost looked to us for how, how should we be monitoring you guys? What types of yeah. safety yeah, what things safety do you have? What safety measures are you going like, to take? And it's like, so we were like, well, we're just starting this, but okay, we'll, we'll help you guys through it. Yeah. So it's just so interesting that these practices, you guys can relate, that we have, as humans, have had for so long, there's so much like pushback mm -hmm. from it. And that's like Something probably like the biggest thing. And innovative. I mean, yeah. fermenting to preserve food has you know, added benefits rather than just like canning it or mm -hmm. freezing it drying it so it's kind of one of those things like, let's get with the program like, this <laughs> is not a new thing it's an old awesome thing that we should be doing with almost everything so a lot of similarities between fermenting yeah. and composting yeah. we yeah. separated ourselves from these uh, biological processes yeah. that allow us to thrive and sustain on this planet and we think oh no something with a bad smell that's bad that's gross yeah. you know and it's like oh, yeah. oh no it's no that's working. just the natural world doing its wonders yeah. yeah i would say that's another big hurdle that i've had to and still i'm constantly trying to work with is with restaurants they're like is it going to stink you know to have these containers yeah. in here and it's like well I mean you can close the lid we pick it up twice a week like it, it's just food material it's not gonna rot overnight mm -hmm. you know it's just the smell of food but it's a mental thing mm -hmm. they, they, yeah. they think that it's a trash can it's full of food and it must be rotting and just totally disgusting and um, yeah so I, I would agree that there's an issue around like these smells and these kind of old older principles that people just I don't know mm -hmm. they thrown away for sterility and I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask you guys, did you have to send your product out of state to get it tested? We haven't yet. That is a step as we grow that we are going to be doing 
I understand that there's a new science person here in Montana who might be doing that. Do you know their name? Um, no. No, but I've got Moonlight Kitchens yeah. in, in Missoula, so. It, there's the, the couple people that we've reached out to, I don't know if they are doing any longer or if they're just so busy, but <laughs> we definitely are looking for someone that will do that for us. See if I can find out more. Okay. Okay. I have a question. If, so like you have to go through the health department to get like a permit or whatever to create like whatever product you're creating. So if, say if you want to add a different, like say you want to make pickles or something, mm -hmm. do you have to go back to the health department or can you just then do that under the same approval? As long as we're following the same process, our process has been approved. Um, when we, we've added a new recipe since we started business and you know I called and, and asked that question and they said as long as you're following the same process. And, you don't have to get like the labels approved. The label, oh, but that's. You really just quick. work kind of closely then with the health mm -hmm. department. Yeah. Yeah. Everything the <laughs> Livingston sanitarian knows about <coughs> fermentation, he learned from <laughs> Vanessa and Vanessa. And that, that's typically one of the biggest challenges we see, Trevor, when we're working with new entrepreneurs who come in with a food idea is the the uh, licensing mm -hmm. issues, you know, city, county, state. Um, but we've developed some some skills on our team to aid with that and, and kind of make that more work more uh, more efficiently. We're we're very conversant with the people in Helena, and if one of our our entrepreneurs has an issue. Uh, we can get on the phone with them, and typically they're they're very helpful, uh, more helpful and responsive than our local sanitarian. Uh, but he's catching on. So uh, the other challenge that we run into, of course, is is financial, is funding. Um, so often, not the 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 first stage of coming in, developing the product, doing some product testing getting ready to market second stage is where people you know Are they outgrow the kitchen uh, well no they haven't outgrown the kitchen oh. they've outgrown their funding sources oh. um, and now, now they've got a product that we've proven through product testing and they're ready to launch they don't have the money to launch you know mm -hmm. to roll it out to scale it up um, so that's an area that we've quite active in. We've got a small loan fund that we have created to make small loans. Uh, we want the loans paid back. They're interest free. The interest that we ask for is you're coming back into the kitchen to work with and help other entrepreneurs get their businesses started. That's really great. Pay it forward. And, and we, we on, our, on our own uh, we develop products that I then look for entrepreneurs to take over. Um, you know, we, we're doing a lot of baking right now, and you've heard me talk about the bakery expansion that we're doing, and we're going to be, through QFD, we're going to be distributing bread throughout the state. And we're developing uh, bread, we're going to be baking bread at no cost to every food pan for every food pantry in Montana. And because I want every food pantry in Montana to have the good Montana source grain and flour made with Mr. Quinn's Corson wheat and wonderful Kamut flour. Um, we're going to bake that bread for every food pantry in Montana. Uh, so we do product development and, and what I want to do then is spin that off for entrepreneurs to build their own businesses. Excellent. So, but the bed, bread baking for all the food pantries, that's not, there's no profit in that. Because I mean, that's what free means. Right? Because, <laughs> exactly. So how does that translate into a business for an entrepreneur? 
Well, taking over the, I'm not talking about that aspect. Oh, I, I'm talking about other, other they would learn products about that we're going to be doing. Okay. Yeah. Creating a basic. Right. Okay. Good. Other questions? And we can open questions, so we'll start here. Well, <coughs> this discussion of financing kind of brings up what I was going to ask about. I mean, clearly this growth period has been important for all of you guys, and you've been incredibly generous about facilitating it, but I wonder if this doesn't kind of lay the opening for more of a discussion of more rural-urban partnerships, some kind of a community banking mechanism that expands upon what has started in Livingston. I mean, all, all of us who've been connected to small farm discussions know that capitalization is one of the primary hurdles and continues to be as farmers grow. Um, and it's not like there isn't plenty of surplus wealth floating around the Gallatin Valley. There's plenty of people who are interested in healthy food. Um, but there aren't that many formal structures to help inform both sides, and I wonder if any, like Missoula or other places, have examples that we can learn from in this valley. Because it seems like there's a lot of people who are chopping at the bit to help, and they don't quite know who to where to go to. Um. I think it's a great a great suggestion. Um, one of the talks last night touched on it a little bit. Um, Jeff Batten has done a little mm -hmm. bit locally, um, but I think that's only, I mean, he's, he, only, he only has so much reach, and there, I think there's a lot more opportunity for that, for sure. Yeah, and Missoula uh, Community Food and Agriculture Coalition, CFAC, uh, is a Kiva loan uh, mentor, and they just had a period where I think they funded five or six different businesses so there's that, and they also <coughs> help with education of farmers and with some of the financial, and they're working with Blackstone and Missoula and too. Missoula. So, okay. yeah, so um, you might give them a call and see what they're up to. <coughs> so other questions? Did yeah, you I do some home fermenting, so I'm wondering about the, the sealing of the jars or in, the, in the, the shelf life afterwards. If you can try and touch on some of that. Um, right now we don't do like a pasteurization or vacuum pack um, or vacuum seal. Um, it's in the health department knows that. We just, you know, put the little tamper seal on it and refrigerate it as soon as we jar it up. And we have to keep it refrigerated as soon as it goes in that jar, right. you know, to stop the fermentation process. And the products, I mean, they'll last so long. I mean, as you would know from yeah. fermenting. Um, but part of the, like, there's you know, different stages. Like, we ha eventually, when we reach a certain revenue level, we have to get our nutritional analysis done on the jars. Um, and that will then allow us to put, like, a definitive, like, use by date. Right. Um, but. Yeah, other than that, it's kind of this. So you're not having to worry area, about yeah. sealing the jar and causing heat to change the. the as long as it stays refrigerated. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's kind of like our our big requirement. I mean, you know, even farmers market farmer markets that are outdoors, you know, we have to be you know, very careful about watching temperature with that, and you know, kind of monitor it in that way. But. Awesome. Other questions in the back. <coughs> Sorry, I just wanted to lose my voice, but um, I was just curious uh, for the Vanessa's and Michael, you were saying that, you know, Heather and Paula Nourish and Delina Pasta, that all these, you know, entrepreneurs from Bozeman are going over to Livingston to process in your facility. And I mean, it's amazing that that resource is there, but is that because of availability in Bozeman of commissary kitchen space, or is that cost, or what's sort of driving that? I mean, because we are definitely a larger community, but I'm just sort of curious about the, the very local system and what's kind of pushing all these people who are driving over the hill and then going back and selling their products. For us, especially originally, I mean, um, the Food Resource Center, for our first year, you, we have like a discounted rate as a food entrepreneur. Um, and so, it was significantly less expensive for us to go to Livingston to produce even though, yeah, we have to drive 30 minutes each way, um, it, the cost savings was huge. Um, and they had a lot more availability as far as like when we could come in. Um, we've talked to some uh, kitchens in Bozeman and they're you know, also super packed. So it's not that they aren't seeing like 
companies like us um, utilizing them. But for, I mean, for us, I originally it was we had connections because I believe it was Blackstone that met like introduced us to the Food Resource Center, and then um, the cost was huge. So. Well, and then my second question was that if Michael, if you're seeing, um, if there's a lot of pressure coming from Bozeman, you know, on your space, if you're having, if you're reaching capacity in terms of time and, and stuff. Well, we haven't reached capacity, not fully, uh, depending on when you want to come in and do your work. I've got a lot of time to rent to you between midnight and 6 a.m. Um, <laughs> That's for hours. Works 24/7, right? <laughs> right. Rather um, not, but. <laughs> no, I think it's a combination of availability. The it's a pretty darn nice kitchen, well equipped. You know, we've got industrial strength equipment that supports this kind of production and scaling up. You know, from your to your initial testing product development to scaling up to a pretty reasonable level and then as as farm minted is is in the process of doing outgrowing us but that's the plan because when the Vanessas move into their shiny new kitchen they that are going to free up space for somebody else to come into the kitchen um, and and the goal there in, in Livingston what I wanted to do was create a model that's scalable. You know, our kitchen supports this market. And, you know, we could make that kitchen a little smaller and put it in Mile City or, you know, wherever. Um, so, that, you know, that's one of the goals is to, to create a, a model for communities to look at to then begin to develop these kinds of resources in their communities and then enabling them to create a true local food system. Great. Excellent. Thank you. Any more questions? Hi, it's Jack. Thanks for the question. Um, somebody in the last session talked about making popsicles. To talk to somebody who makes kombucha. Do you have any other food product ideas that are on the table right now in this innovative that? Somebody might be testing. In our kitchen? Yes, sir. I can't tell you. That's <laughs> <laughs> a secret sauce, right? Yeah. No, you know, we, we do. Right now, we've, we've got a pretty active group of people who are in the very early stages. We've got, uh, and, and the stories are wonderful. We should be making a movie. Uh, <laughs> we've got a fellow in our kitchen right now who relatively young and he's been a mason all his life and he is just he's physically he's just broken up mm -hmm. from being a mason all his life and he's trying to shift careers and he is the classic story he makes at home he makes frozen custard and he came in but one of the things i i do with people when they come in and say gee i want to rent the kitchen and start a business. They have to come in and convince me that, that they're really, you know, they're really dedicated to this. They've got a viable idea and that they've got the capacity to see it through. And he convinced me and he came in, this, this guy is a natural born marketer. He came in with samples of three or four of his different custards. Were you in there the night he came in? We did. I don't think so. We got everybody together. <laughs> we got everybody together and we've got some pretty ornery, you know, foodies uh, <laughs> in our circle over there. And uh, we tasted his frozen custard and everybody wanted to know when they could get more. <laughs> it was out of this world. And so we're working with him right now on developing his product. Uh, so we've, we've got a number of situations like that. Some of them stick. You know, the guy who came in to make frozen bananas, um, he didn't last too long. Um, not much of a market for frozen bananas. Chocolate, you know, dipped in chocolate. Uh, and we get a lot of folks through the launch pad here as well. You know, new product ideas or, and we'll, we'll point a lot of them to Michael, you know, over, over there to try it out, pilot it out, start small, test it out, don't. 
um, don't go build a kitchen first or buy a restaurant. Um, Pop-ups, you know, test things out before, you know, you really make sure there's a customer for it. That's what we do a lot of teaching on. So, um, other questions that we got in this group here. One quick question yeah. for the composters. Um, so, do you have to add something, a carbon product, to offset your nitrogen, or so what, where do you get their product? Um, for us, we uh, have a great working relationship with a lot of local arborists who are dropping off wood chips constantly at our yard. We're a convenient site for them because typically they would maybe need to take it to a, like you know a landfill or they, they're just always looking at places to get rid of. So if like if they know where we're at and if they're doing jobs in within that radius, we're saving them money um, on trucking that. Uh, that carbon elsewhere. Um, and then also we work with um, just really one wood shop in town that we know isn't using any sort of treated material, well two technically that aren't using any sort of treated lumber so we're taking their wood shavings as well. And then um, this time of year obviously leaves, anyone can bring us leaves if they, if, if, if they want as well. Yeah, we just, we have a tip free drop off site. Mm -hmm. So we're lucky enough to have more space. Um, in the community that the closest town that we live in there's no leaf uh, pickup or anything like that so uh, a lot of them are part of us they don't have to take it to the landfill further away and they don't have to pay mm -hmm. and they get to drop it with us and we recycle it so yeah yeah and they like that as well yeah it's, it's yeah. again yeah they you know there are people that are working you know in this natural world so they love to see you know it being utilized again awesome i was going to ask each of these ventures, community resources, um, like what's your ask of Arrow, of the Arrow community um, going forward, short term, long term, how can this community help you guys um, with your business and or, yeah, just what, or what, anything else you'd want to share with them. So here, there, who wants to start? Compost or, or fermented product? If anyone has ideas how to fight the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> Do some good negotiators? Yeah. Maybe? yeah. Just talk to the city commissioners. Yeah, yeah. really. Politics. That's something, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess that's what, that, that's a very specific thing we're facing right now is this whole, you know, and I'm not, we're not by any means trying to paint a bad <laughs> picture of Bozeman City Council or Gallatin Solid Waste, but, you know, we went these conventional routes of saying, hey, this is who we are, look, you know, how can we work together if this is truly something you're looking at? That we've felt like we've been, the door has been shut in our face too many times, and so now we are taking this more of like, um, hands-on like attack, not attack, but just like a more defensive approach <laughs> where it's like, we're planning on sending out form letters to all of our residential clients and commercial clients saying like, yeah. hey, you know, don't compete with this these entrepreneurs you know this is why we value their service and I will add too about our service we with both our residential and commercial clients we pick up full buckets and we drop off clean buckets so we're washing buckets out we have a gray water system too that we capture the washed the water from washing which is going to have the nice nitrogen content in it and we're pumping that back into our active uh, piles because like all living organisms microbes need water to 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 survive and in in the hot summers you do typically need to water down your piles if you're not getting your uh moisture content right so when you're first building out your windrows so we are pumping that gray water back in so just another aspect of um you know so we are providing this premium service that you know we hope that's why people will want to work with us ultimately but yeah uh, writing form letters going to city council meetings you know saying and not only just this isn't just about us as well there are other composters in this community but it's also too saying no no we want to support ultimately a sustainable food system in our community and a big component of that is a waste diversion uh, program that has also a nice fertility uh, program attached to it as well too you know it's just completing this cycle and so really truly understanding that um, excellent and if, we, and if someone wants to sign up for your service they can yep you can go to happytrashcan.net and you hit <coughs> sign up we use uh, moon clerk it's a secure online dot payment. net dot uh, net dot yeah net. dot net okay. don't go to top dot com that, that's owned by someone in uh, georgia i think it's, uh, <laughs> okay yeah oh, there. 
<laughs> Question here. Alyssa, when you had to scale up quickly, how did you, what did you go through to do that? Um, I had one investor in particular that, that helped us initially. Um, and I'm, that was really the first thing. The, the biggest obstacle was having um, the equipment that could handle that capacity that fast. Um, so we had to get a dump truck, a small dump truck. Um, and knowing that we were gonna have that money flowing in, we're, we're unique because we had that money and that contract from a, a very large entity flowing in very quickly. Um, so that was able to work out for us. So in that sense, we are very unique. But now we're in this place um, that, yeah, we're having different struggles with growing as well. But that's, that's the best answer I can give you. <laughs> Um, and uh, I mean, I think that you summed that up really well. Um, as far as just making sure that we're focusing on the entire s circle of um, not just producing, distributing, um, but also finishing that out in the cycle. But on a really simple level, I think um, a lot of my community does not think of composting as recycling. They're like, they're very much like, we need to recycle, it's so important, and la la la, but they focus on plastic. And um, I find that to be a huge distraction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I think it's, it's a really uh, controversial thing to say, I think, but I think we need to stop focusing on plastic. I think we need to think about reducing the amount of plastic, not, not stop focusing on, stop focusing on recycling plastic. We need to reduce single-use plastic, just stop using it. And I think that's a really huge hurdle to overcome, but in the recycling world and coming from a small composter's perspective, it's really important because then we can focus on the things that we can actually recycle locally in our communities and create value from them. So um, that aspect and just thinking of compost, composting as recycling and talking about it as a form of recycling because oftentimes, like when I'm in the city talking about it, they. They're, they're talking about recycling, but they're not including food food waste as part mm -hmm. of the waste stream that needs to be thought about. So that's an issue. Would it be helpful then to you if people in the local community went to the city meetings? God, yes. So yeah. send out I'm the an only email. one there. <laughs> yeah. What's that? Send out an email or something. I have, but <laughs> I will continue to. Okay. And I think everybody's really busy, but I yeah. think that it would it would help to show up to city council meetings, sure. but. It, um, and steering committees and all of those things. So yeah, yeah. good point. Uh, definitely. We don't have enough time to do it all. Yeah, exactly. It's like <laughs> you, right. we're all and everyone on this panel, like we're busy running small businesses, I and it's it. like a David mm -hmm. versus Goliath situation here. And so we do need the support from our community as well. And I mean, we had Becky has been a wonderful ally uh, recently for us, and, and has written letters on our behalf and and other composters' on behalf as well. And, you know, it's just it's just as long because if no one's telling these city commissioners and, and these people that are running our local governments one way or another, well, they're just going to go with the easiest route. You know, it's uh, for them, and 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 I, you know, I get it. They don't. You know, they've got a lot on their plate. They're running a whole city, I suppose, and so you know, they can't see all the nuances in what we're trying to talk about, but we run into the same issue, but with glass in this community. Uh, people always come up to us because we, off, we, we, we uh, compost, we offer our services for free at the, comp, at the um, farmer's markets in Livingston in here where all the food vendors have switched over to compostable serviceware and then we collect that and compost it away. It's a good education tool. Um, but then people come up to us, oh, do you take glass? And it's like, oh, no, we don't take glass. And like, you know, oh, well, geez, I just, uh, I'm a, I hate throwing glass away. And it's like, well, hold on. You know, it's like, yeah, glass is great. It's infinitely recyclable. But ultimately, like, here's something, you know, what about food waste? Oh, yeah, maybe I'll think about it. I'll take a flyer. It's like, you know, throwing glass into a landfill, it's, yeah, it's not great, but it's going to be pretty inert, you know. And, instead right. of throwing organic material. <laughs> and I do think too, just in general, and I think it's it's happening more, there is more education happening about the end product of what food waste is doing in landfills and, and what methane is compared to CO2. And, mm -hmm. and that is still pretty new to everyone. And I think if people start realizing that food is not breaking down in landfills, then they'll also start thinking of it more as a necessary, necessary recycling uh, you know, but 
um, that's still like we're always teaching people like it's not breaking down at a landfill. <laughs> but um, anyway. I have a kind of specific composting question. Can you compost the like plastic silverware that says it's compostable? You yep. Yep. Yeah. Well, these cups right here? Yeah, all these <laughs> cups, all of this, uh, you know, we and we work with a lot of our commercial clients here in town uh, and to help guide them because there, of course, is greenwashing in this. And, and there are companies like World Centric that specifically only produce compostable serviceware. They're not an existing package company like Pactive or Dixie or Solo that is in the business of making packaging so they can kind of sly a little bit about oh well this is an eco product you know it's like no this has been this this material here is they've done their research it's it can be broken down in our piles easily a home composter it, it's 130 days or 100 or 30, 30 days at 130 degrees and this material is is, is you know physically degraded and, and you know i don't want to speak too much i think that we're like anything, I'm always a little hesitant. It's like, let's see 20 years from now how things are looking in terms of putting things under a microscope. But right but, but right now, it's it's this is this is good. A home composter can easily maintain 130 degrees and during the summertime, you know. Uh, so yeah. Okay. Excellent. Um, Question. Yep. I have more of a comment. I've just been thinking about um, how much you've been talking about. The mafia, and <laughs> maybe it, it also takes kind of a, a re-messaging because composting um, food waste is very related to, to some of the solutions that are being talked about for climate change. Mm -hmm. And right now, whitefish, Missoula, Bozeman are all in the process of preparing or, or revising their climate plans. Mm -hmm. So this might be a moment to really try to push it, but from perhaps a different angle. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah I mean, I'd like to comment on that because the Bozeman City Commission has not only said they want to be leaders on climate smart policies, but they say they want to be an example for other towns in the state. Yes. And I think that um, we, I think literally it's a matter of education. I don't think right now they understand how incomplete their current proposed solution is. And so, you know, can, so citizens don't need to attack them. We just need to educate exactly. them. Exactly, right? yeah, thank um, you. Yeah. And, but I think it is part of a larger issue because based on comments I've heard from people in the city, I think this is part and parcel of the broader challenge that faces Arrow and how we as a society are perceiving small farming right now. A lot of people still don't take it seriously. Mm. They still don't believe that Montana has the capacity to relearn how to feed itself like it used to 50 years ago. And that's a battle that probably everybody has a member of their own family here that also doesn't take local food seriously. And so I think this is really what Ryan and Adrian have experienced is really just a small piece of that broader problem. And if anybody really doubts that, they should just take a trip to California that's trying to get five growing seasons of organic vegetables while the Pacific Ocean is and forest fires are taking over California. We are not going to continue to be able to rely on California. So mm -hmm. we kind of got to take it seriously. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I just think there's a lot of people in the Bozeman City Commission who don't really quite grasp those concepts yet. That's very true. Yeah. Yeah. Michael? One thing that this group can do to help you guys, or two, or one. <laughs> Educate communities as to the importance and value of local food systems. The definition of a local food system is not the Cisco truck pulling into town and unloading. Mm -hmm. And teach communities how they can leverage that local food system to drive economic development, health care, and education in their communities that make their communities a, a more vibrant, healthier, stronger, better place to live. Excellent. Thank you. Vanessa? Um, everyone's kind of talked on it, and it seems inherently obvious, um, but buy local whenever you can. Um, we know that it's not the cheapest item on the shelf. You don't have to tell us that we're more expensive than the national brand, we get it. But a lot of work goes into it of our, from our producers to like us actually manufacturing the product. 
we don't choose the least expensive you know items just to make the highest margins we are constantly looking to decrease our costs so we can make our products more affordable but we can only do that if our community members and our customers support us where we are right now um, and that goes for any food manufacturing company any company really like it, there's economies of scale and if like we're not supported when you know our margins are terrible like we're never going to be able to get to the point where like we can make fermented super readily available to everyone um, and so that and that just it doesn't just apply to us that applies to the whole food system in general um, so. yeah but with your checkbook and you know helping out you know local producers for sure that's awesome any other questions comments before we wrap up I think there's a happy hour so people might want to go to that you know um, good. Uh, I just want to say thank you to this amazing panel I've had the great opportunity to work with three of them and then get to know three of them today I was actually really excited to learn a lot more about compost composting and gonna absolutely um, I thank you guys so much this, you're doing amazing work all of you and keep it up and let us know how this group can continue to help you guys support you um, I think there's a lot of opportunity, so let's keep the discussions going. But yeah, really nice job. So thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks everyone.